Welcome everyone to this post Labor Day hot and cold show. This is the hot and cold for September 4th. We got school back in session. The summer is officially over. Well, not officially because it ends at the end of September, right, Jack? Yeah, which is kind of weird, but yeah, September 22nd or something like that. Yeah. But for all intents and purposes, summer's over. So we're here with the hot and cold show for September 4th. We are officially calling this the body bag episode because we have a lot of people on the DL who or who are out, but we do have people pinch hitting. We even have a return of one of the old characters from Simpleman's Comics YouTube show, but that's going to be a surprise with me right now is my co-host Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Man, excited to be here. Like you said, uh, we had to make some roster shifts this week, but with that comes a little excitement because you just never know what to expect. Uh, some new faces, some new names. Um, they may be new to you, but a few of them are very familiar to me. <laughs> right. So, with that being said, we're not going to talk too much about it. We're just going to get right into the hot and cold list, starting with the first hot pick from... Cover Tunes author, Mike Morello. Hey everybody, Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes, coming at you from a slightly different location this week with my hot pick. And this week, I just can't ignore how hot She-Hulk continues to be. Um, more than a week out since D23 News, um, and this book is still selling like absolute crazy. Um, over 100 copies of this book have sold since last week and they're double in price what they were. You could have gotten a raw for 35, 40, 45 bucks um, two weeks ago, now you can't touch one for less than $100. Um, and the nicer they get, the more expensive they get. Nine eights, they've gone up almost double as well. You could have gotten one for 250 300 maybe about a week ago. Now you can't touch one for less than 500 um, or even 600 depending on what day you're buying it. Um, and of course, with that in tandem comes other issues, um, and this is the other one that's selling like crazy. Um, tons and tons of copies flying of this book as well, but the crazy thing is this was a dollar book, a quarter book. Um, a week ago, and now here we are. It's a $15 book now. Um, still a cool book. There are other books in this series, by the way, this 1989 series that are cool too. That number 34, the beach ball, pregnant sort of cover. Um, and then other books from that era that are worth uh, thinking about looking for, that Hulk 441 Pulp Fiction homage, which uh, had gone back down to a $5 book, and now it's back up again to a $15, $20 book again. Um, and then, of course, with that, uh, because of a certain sort of scene in Endgame, as well as She-Hulk sort of combined news together, um, talk is back out again for A-Force. This is just the A cover, but there's tons and tons of variants for these. There's two series, don't forget. There's the 2015 1 through 5, and then there's the 2016 1 through 10. And uh, there's a lot of variants for those. The Hughes is obviously an expensive one. The Hans, uh, because of the singularity uh, appearance, is obviously a, a sought-after one. But there's others as well. And the one maybe to keep an eye on is that Molina which uh, does have She-Hulk on the cover. Um, but with She-Hulk's heat, um, I think that we're going to see a lot of these books moving. A lot of books that you might not have expected to move are going to start to move as well. But for now, Savage She-Hulk number one, Sensational She-Hulk number one, and uh, really all A-Force number ones, especially the variants. And that's my hot pick for the week. Thanks, everybody. Always love Mike Morales' picks. He's talking She-Hulk here. No doubt, D23, Disney Plus News, She-Hulk is hot fire right now. He brought up a lot of good points. I, for one, was lazy. I never picked up that Savage She-Hulk number one, especially when it was cheap 9 8 Now they're going up. So I, for me, I'm going to wait the cycle out. And hopefully they drop back down again. Don't think they'll drop to where they were probably two or three years ago. But I'm going to wait it out. A lot of great books. There's a lot of great books he didn't even discuss. Like I, for one, love that Heroic Age She-Hulk variant that J. Scott Campbell but what are your thoughts on this pick, Jack? Well, yeah, first off, there's so many She-Hulk books of no... I think She-Hulk has been overlooked in the market for quite some time. Um, with that uh, sensational She-Hulk run, he mentioned number one and number 34, but don't sleep on number 40, that nude issue with the uh, editor, the new Marvel editor on the cover. I think that that is a uh, book that has commanded as much as $100 at times, usually goes for about 60 to 75 and, you know, you mentioned that Heroic Age uh, She-Hulk with J. Scott Campbell. There's also, like, the Fall of the She-Hulk's connecting cover set that J. Scott Campbell did. J. Scott did a lot of She-Hulk work during that era. Um, and the reality is these books have been overlooked for a long time. And now the whole market is kind of open to all of this She-Hulk speculation, all of these diff different She-Hulk covers. Um, I know there's a lot of people excited about A-Force. My 
my kind of like hesitation with A Force is just the fact that that came off of one of those rumor websites, and you kind of got to pump the brakes with that a little bit. Plus, you got to use your kind of common sense that She Hulk is a couple years away. So we would be probably five, seven years away before we would see some sort of A Force thing. Not that it isn't good spec, but for those reasons, I like A Force number one, the regular cover. Because I don't want to sink a bunch of money into something that's probably years and years and years away from any sort of, you know, real ROI. But I did a convention this weekend and, you know, those dollar bin diggers were out there and it seemed like one of the most common things they were grabbing in mass was She-Hulk random issues. Um, She-Hulk volume ones, She-Hulk volume twos from that sensational She-Hulk run. And then I went on eBay and saw that a lot of these issues are selling for seven, eight, nine dollars plus shipping. Really surprised. I mean, issues that don't feature first appearances, issues that are, um, you know, just filler issues. Just some with cool covers, some with more risque covers. They that all of these issues seem to be in demand and selling. And it seems like there's people out there building runs of She-Hulk. Um, the other book that I would watch out for, or be on the lookout for, of course is um, Marvel Secret Wars number three, the first appearance of Titania, who is kind of the ideal supervillain for She-Hulk. That book seems to be on the rise, selling for about $15. Previously, just a filler issue in those sets. You know, you could usually buy any book in that run um, other than number one or number eight for a dollar, and now that book seems to be getting picked up on a regular basis. So be on the lookout for that one certainly could see her show up at some point down the road but i'm excited for i'm excited for she hulk i think i hope we get the lawyer version of she hulk um and uh you know i think that there's a lot of potential for that character personally instead of seeing a force i'd rather see them do like champions but that's just my opinion yeah i agree so that was a great pick from Mike, and we're going to roll right into the next hot pick this week, and it comes from Dollar Bin Digging author on ComicBookInvest.com, Peter Renna. What's going on, everybody? This is Peter Renna with my hot pick this week, and while I could have made this pick as my choice last week, it's still hot, so I'm going to use it this week, and that is Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. With her uh, animated series on the way on one of the Disney services, whether it be streaming or the regular old Disney channel, uh, the interest is there. Uh, people are excited. Uh, that's a $340.98 now these days, where back in December it was only $85. Bucks. You can get one at that uh, same grade. Uh, that's quite a jump. It's a few short months, so the uh, interest is definitely there. And it's not just the current series, number one, that's uh, showing interest, but the original Devil Dinosaur, number one, which I used to own, but I sold mine a while back. And that's also $350.98 these days. So while I don't have that book, I'm just going to show you this uh, pretty awesome Del Auto version of him on that Avenging Spider-Man. So... Uh, the original Devil Dinosaur, again, that also is showing some uh, some heat there. Uh, and then there's minor keys in her current series the, with the, you know, little Princess Fisk and, uh, you know, these villains that might show up on the animated series. While the prices aren't really going up from when they're their previous highs, those are like $15 to $20 books these days. It's just the volumes there. So in the last week or so, uh, copies are moving. So I would say that uh, this week, Moon Girl, Devil Dinosaur, it's hot. All right, Jack, so there we have Peter talking Moon Girl, other news that came out of D23 Expo. If you're not familiar with what D23 Expo is, it is the Disney 23 Expo that takes place every year where they talk about Disney stuff. They talk about what's going on in the parks. And now that they have Marvel and then they're starting their streaming service, there was a lot of information that came out of there. But we're talking Moon Girl as a hot pick. This has been hot a while before. A lot of people were speculating on it. Talking about how low the print runs for it. And all I heard was the teacher from Peanuts because I have no interest in Moon Girl. It could be the next Amazing Fantasy number 15 if for all I care. Never been a fan. Not going to deny that it is hot right now. I think it will die down as soon as the cartoon comes out. Because this isn't a Disney Plus show. This is a Disney Channel cartoon. We saw this with Big Hero 6. We saw this with a bunch of other cartoons that came out. There was some spec. You saw some bump for it. But I think once that cartoon comes out, unless they have other plans for this character, it's going to dive right back down. But I digress because I don't care about the characters at all. I'm going to let you have your turn now, Jack. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those ones where I'm kind of on the fence about, Brian. First off, you and I are both in the same 
um, kind of boat where we neither of us have been big fans of the character. Not saying that we don't like the character, but that we don't necessarily believe in the spec of the character. Um, while, yes, the print runs were exceptionally low, they were exceptionally low because there weren't a lot of readers reading the series. But that's in monthly format. An important thing to note was that the trades were on the scholastic reading list at a lot of schools. They were selling really well at book fairs. And it means that, you know, kids were picking this up. Now, I've heard it pointed out that it's most likely parents buying the book for their kids. but Or Mel. Yeah, or, or Mel buying them all. But uh, it, nonetheless, um, these were getting in the hands of children. There are children who are aware of these. Um, and my daughter told me she read it in school, which threw me off. I didn't realize that. So um, I think that that is going to be a real case study. And we're not going to know until the series hits. But the best point that you made of why I think that this is a tough speculation to go hard on is that it's Disney Channel. Um, now, I have two daughters. I'm a big fan of everything that Disney Channel does. I love the Marvel Rising stuff. But the Marvel Rising stuff hasn't really translated into any sort of real speculation. Um, you know, the show did well. There were there were Halloween costumes. My daughters wore the costumes. They own the dolls. They, they're all in on it. But it still hasn't really translated into any money for us, you know, adult male speculators, which is fine. Not everything's for us. But that's where I would caution somebody who's going out maybe spending $40 on that Moon Girl number one. Now, some of the other first appearances I, I, that were at one point hot that have now fallen off, I'm a little bit more interested in because some of them can be found in dollar bins or for cover price, and they may spike to 10 to $15. And there you're talking about Princess Fisk, um, onomatopoeia, um, and both of those first appearances had like that cameo first appearance, full first confusion. So there's like two issues to keep an eye on. And another one is Girl Moon, which was issue number 19. There was a lot of speculation on that incentive variant. Um, and that book shot up for a while and has now kind of come back down to earth. But a good example of how that book had gotten cold for a while, and one of our channel sponsors, Frankie's Comics, they even had a four-pack set of that Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur number 19, first appearance of Girl Moon. And this set featured three trade dress black and white versions exclusive to Frankie's Comics, printed to only 3,000, and one virgin copy with that purple moon. And that has no trade dress and was limited to just 1,000 copies. These got hot at one point and now have sat on their site for so long they've cut the price in half. So you get the four-pack set for just $10. Now that's a low buy-in that I can understand a speculator taking a shot at. So a lot of those appearances, whether it's Onomatopoeia, Princess Fisk, or Girl Moon, have dropped to a point where I understand speculators may be taking a shot at those. But those high-priced issue number one, $40, 30 $35, I'm a little more leery about taking that kind of spec jump. And it's important, you know, we've also seen Devil Dinosaur number one jump up as well. Um, you know, that was a kind of Bronze Age $5 book for quite some time. And now that book is in qu quite a bit of demand. So I think there's a lot of people on this series, but I wonder if there's the speculation isn't based on the fact that the news came out during D23 and people are kind of lumping it in with, say, She-Hulk and Miss Marvel and everything else that's coming out. And it's really important to note that it's really a whole different thing being that it's, it's a Disney Channel property. Right, and I think a large part of it is, is people are specking waiting for an announcement to come, and then a Disney Channel announcement comes, and everyone's like, ha-ha! And now it's a goldmine for them. Or right. it isn't. But either way, they are hot right now. They are selling more on the secondary market. And for those that aren't familiar with what the secondary market is, where you buy your comic at your local comic book store, that is your primary market. And then if you buy them there and then sell them on eBay or wherever after the fact, that is the secondary market. I say that because we have gotten comments where people ask, hey, what's the secondary market? So that's what it is for you. Yeah, and I think if I was speculating on Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, which full transparency was never something Brian and I were big on, but if I was speculating on it over these years and sitting on a stash of those books, now would be the time I'd be looking to sell because those prices are right. I'd be happy with the ROI on that sale, yeah. and now I'd be cashing out now and not risking will this Disney Channel show take off. And again, even if it takes off, if it takes off with kids, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to do anything for secondary market value of comics. Yeah. So a great pick from Peter. We're going to roll right into the next hot pick this week. And it comes from true first author Topher S. The Masked 
Speculator. What's up, everybody? It's your friendly neighborhood speculator. This week's pick is Moon Knight related. The Black Spectre is hot. When a show gets announced, the natural reaction is to look the top villain up. In this case, I'm not sure that's the Black Spectre. But Moon Knight's rogue gallery is less Batman and more Hawkman. The Black Spectre actually makes a lot of sense in this case, and his first is doing pretty well. Look for the printing error on this one. Some copies have a center white dot. Near mint copies of that black cover are going to be real hard to find. He didn't appear in too many other books either, so there could be some other covers out there to look for. See you next week! So there we have Topher, the innovative mask speculator with the bag mask this week. Actually, this was when he was on vacation and didn't have masks, so he did go creative. And speaking of creative, he was talking about the Black Spectre. Now, there's three different versions of these that we are aware of in the Marvel Universe, right? There's also the fictional organization that's from the Daredevil comics. But there's two different Black Spectres from Moon Knight comics himself. One being Carson Knowles. And then there's a newer updated one, which is Ryan Trent. Right, Jack? What do you think about this pick? Right. And this is the tough thing about speculation is I can see a lot of people going and grabbing that Daredevil 108 because they type in Black Spectre into their Google search. That's what comes up. And they may run with that. Um, you know, a more experienced maybe Moon Knight reader would look at that Moon Knight 25, a book that's been iconic and popular for a long time, not just because of Black Spectre, but just the cover in itself, that Bill Sankevich cover. Um, tough black cover, hard to find in great shape. And I think that's the one that will draw most speculators' attention. But one to be on the lookout for is that that third one, that Ryan Trent um, as, as Black Spectre. And this is where speculation gets tough and really truly becomes speculation. You end up guessing a bit. But um, he first appears as a detective in Moon Knight number one from the volume seven, the popular Warren Ellis run. This was once a $15 to $20 book, is now six, seven dollars, I think has a lot of value. And a lot of people that I've talked to have speculated that this could be the series that the Disney Plus series is based upon, that Warren Ellis run. And if so, that would be the book to keep an eye on. Now, he also appears in number six, an issue titled Spectre, where he takes over the mantle of Black Spectre, and he does it in an aim to take over from Moon Knight. So this could be the type of thing where... Um, Everyone goes in one direction, loading up on those Moon Knight 25s, and it ends up being those Warren Ellis issues that are key, and it's really tough. But I would be on the lookout for all of those issues um, if you're looking in back issue bins, and any undervalued Black Spectre issues, I would go ahead and grab. Yeah, minus the Daredevil ones. Yeah, minus the Daredevil ones. Which, we were looking at it, and like the costumes almost look similar, which was kind of crazy, right? Right, there's no way that they didn't draw some yeah. sort of inspiration for that uh, Moon Knight 25 Black Spectre costume from that Daredevil 108 group. Yep. So thanks, Topher, for that pick, and we're going to go into the next hot <coughs> pick this week. And it comes from Simple Man's Comics YouTube channel, and we are talking about Rooster River. Are we live? Are we, are we live? I'm telling you, we're live. <laughs> Why don't you tell me? What's up, guys? I am back. Rooster River here. Rooster! I've been asked to give a hot pick, and I am here to do so. And I tell you what, you want to know what's hot right now? Hotter than a fried bologna sandwich? I'm talking about none other than Donnie Cates. That guy is freaking hot. Everything he writes right now turns to gold. Look at it. Write it down. Look at Gardens of the Galaxy. Yeah. You know what? And you're like, oh, that's not doing nothing right now. I'll tell you what, though. You look at them signed copies. I'm talking about raw signed copies are selling for like $20. No one likes signed copies unless it's Donny Cates. They picking them up. What's normally selling for cover is selling for $20 right now. Look it up. $20. That's more than I spent at Kino down at the Piggly Wiggly on Tuesday nights. And you know what else is hot? Venom. Especially number one, number two, number three. The whole run right now, number three is hot. Number seven, number nine with that character, Bob Dylan, whatever his name is. Check it out. I'm telling you, prove me wrong. What else is hot? Silver Surfer Black. Expect you them second prints. Number one. Pick them up. I'm telling you, Donna Cates is hot. Back in 2011, 2015, everything with Scott Snyder and Batman and Witches and Wake and all these other. Not no more. We are all about Donna Cates. It is hot. Mark it down. Stamp it. Put it in the J.C. Penny Christmas catalog because it is hot and it's here to stay. Rooster River out. Rooster! So there we have it. Rooster River. 
A lot of people asking, when was Rooster going to return to the channel? So we got him back as a guest pick for the hot pick, and he's talking Donny Cates. I couldn't agree with him more myself, because we all know Donny Cates is hot. Venom's hot. Guardians of the Galaxy. Silver Surfer Black. He made us care about Inhumans for a short time. But what do you think about this, Jack? Oh, I love the pick. I mean, Donny Cates is the king of the A-list. He is the number one writer in comics right now. There's just no doubt. He seems to have an understanding of the secondary market when in actuality he really doesn't. He doesn't pay attention to the secondary market. He's just truly a comic fan and he loves to pull from old issues and and change the lore of these characters that we love and kind of give us different angles on it. And it's, it's really resonated with comic book fans. So all of those runs that Rooster was talking about there and it figures that a guy like Rooster River brings up a Texan like Donny Cates but you know I just they, they're they all hot and yeah Guardians of the Galaxy may not be like the hottest thing going but I've often said that that's a sleeper series I think it's only getting overlooked because of Venom and it, we're one Guardians of the Galaxy event away from that series becoming just red hot um you've all I actually like, you like said, Guardians better than I'd like the Silver Surfer Black series I do too I do too as well um, I've enjoyed reading Guardians, and I think a lot of people anticipated that Death of Rocket Raccoon maybe being that that story arc, and it just hasn't quite gone that way. But it's still something to keep keep an eye out for, be on the lookout for. But yeah, I mean, she's talking Silver Surfer, Black Venom is red hot. He's killing Venom, and then Absolute Carnage. I mean, look what he's doing with Absolute Carnage, and now already the solicitation for Venom Island. And the idea that Venom Island is the next arc sent Amazing Spider-Man 347 through the roof. That's the first appearance of Venom Island. Also, be on the lookout for Dark Hawk 13 and 14. Those are the two other appearances of Venom Island that are, that are still kind of being overlooked in the market. But, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's another writer hotter than Donny Cates. And even his properties that aren't as hot right now, some of those indie properties like Baby Teeth and God Country. He's writing the God Country movie for Legendary Pictures. And I, I could totally see Baby Teeth getting adapted. And I just think he's been so busy with his Marvel work that he hasn't – there's only so much time in the day for a guy like that. So that's something to, to keep an eye out for. And look at the guy. He even did the Midtown exclusive variant cover for Absolute Carnage. So now the guy's drawing covers. So <laughs> I won't mean, say it's the best, but he's doing it. No, a know, for I effort. Won't, I won't say it's the best, but I give him credit for doing it. So the bottom line is the guy is – everywhere he's everywhere and he's doing everything and the and bottom he, line is people bought that cover they did they did and i can see i can see it having long-term secondary market value just because how many donny cates covers are truly going to exist out there yeah. so and um you know i think i think donny cates is a fan favorite i think he's going to be a fan favorite for a long time um and i tell you what if you ever meet the guy couldn't be a nicer guy um couldn't be when you talk to him he immediately has that enthusiasm for comics and that makes you that makes you like him and root for him. So I'm all about this pick. Do, Donny Cates is red hot, and I think we could put him on this list every week. In reality, so good pick, Rooster. Yeah, def definitely, Rooster. Go down there and play some Keno at the Piggly Willy. <laughs> but so with the next hot pick for this week, we are gonna go with someone that you kind of know this person, Jack. In fact, Jack, I'm gonna let you introduce this next gentleman. Okay, well, we're talking about Mark Defiant. For those of you in the chat regularly on Simpleman's Comics, you may see that name show up. But we're talking about my brother, Mark DeMeo. Um, he has been maybe my biggest influence in comics. He's younger than me. But when I was growing up playing with action figures and collecting sports cards, he was the big comics guy. And that was the thing we bonded over. So this is my brother, Mark Defiant, a.k.a. Mark DeMeo, a.k.a. the brother Bolo. And his hot pick this week on the Hot and Cold Show. My name is Mark Defiant. I've done camera work for both Civil Men's Comics and CBSI. And my hot pick is X Books. As a kid, I loved the cartoons and the comics. And it is awesome to see it come back into prominence because of Jonathan Hickman's House of X and Powers of X. And it's cool to see that uh, the back issues and the first appearances have all started to spike. And it's all going to keep going up because we know they're going to show up in the MCU. So there we have Brother Bolo, Mark Defiant. We're talking about X-Books, especially with the Jonathan Hickman runs that's going on right now between House of X, Powers of X, and then just confusing the crap out of me on which one's coming out which week. 
constantly messing it up, but the story's been great and the books have been taken off and it's causing people to go back and buy some of those back issues. What do you have to say about this, Jack? I mean, I, I agree with, obviously, Mark, we grew up watching that cartoon together. Um, and, you know, we grew up, like we like to say, in that Jim Lee, um, that blue and yellow X-Men era. Um, so for a long time, X books have been cold. And Jonathan Hickman with House of X and Powers of X has brought it back into prominence. That's now, not only That's because for a long time, not only were they cold, but X-Men books weren't very good. No, they weren't. They really and truly weren't. Um, I would say since Messiah Complex, they've been really kind of downhill too many teams too confusing of uh you know what books you wanted to read and then in general you're right the books just weren't very good and you know what? another thing that affected it is those fox movies so mark mentioned um having them come into the mcu i think that's a big deal so this is really a two-part speculation play first you've got the house of x and powers of x and the fact that those issues in and of themselves are popular they've also increased the popularity of the Omega level mutants. We've seen like Uncanny X Men '96 blow up. We've seen Uncanny X Force '25 start to get popular. A lot of the back issues uh, surrounding, you know, just the traditional X Men. Um, Phalanx. Uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but his first appearance has taken off. A lot of X Men first appearances that I wouldn't even know would ever be as popular as they are have suddenly become books that people are pulling out of back issue bins and proudly sharing their hauls. Even in the Simpleman's Comics uh, Patreon Discord, we're seeing a lot of X-Men first appearance polls. Um, another thing is the movie spec. The reality is we know that um, the mutants are coming, as Kevin Feige said. So we know that you know we're going to see the X-Men at some point. And that's reinvigorated spec on... Old, appear, old characters that had already appeared, from Rogue to um, Bishop, these are attainable first appearances. Um, so those are those are ones to keep an eye out for. And I'd also even say, um, I talk about this book all the time, even though it's printed 9 million copies at X-Men number one, those Jim Lee covers, I still think those are in demand right now from collectors who are trying to A, get in on that nostalgia, and B, try to get ahead of the market. Right, I tried to jump on a couple of those X Men runs. What was the 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 Adam? Yeah. Then the Brian each, Michael Bendis story. Right, and each time I found myself found myself wanting, but I did like the Uncanny X Force back yes. in 2011. That was one of my favorite runs, and um, I was sad to see that one end. But the books are hot right now, and we've talked about it. I've never been a huge X Men fan, but I have been enjoying House and Powers of X. Great, I think especially for myself and for others that aren't X-Men fans, it is actually a great jumping on point. So I think that's why I enjoy it more also. Yeah, and I, I have said this a few times when we've discussed those books, whether here, the Bolo Show, or um, other shows on the channel when, you know, shows where we had the Hot 10 on the channel. Um, you know, the interesting thing is going to be what do they do beyond House and Powers of X? As popular as those series have been, once they spin off into individual teams, will it continue the heat? That's what I'm interested to see. So thanks for that hot pick from Brother Bolo. And we're going to roll right into the next hot pick, which comes from Brian McClay, who is also on the CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside podcast, as well as the brand new Hot 10 video that is on the Tales from the Flipside YouTube channel as well. What's up, everyone? Brian McClay from CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside, here to give my pick for this week's Hot and Cold show. I'm going to do a hot pick for this week, and I think it's pretty obvious that mine is Snake Eyes. This here is the version 3 figure from the 3 and 3 fourths G.I. Joe line back in the early 90s. Now, of course, I'm too big of a G.I. Joe nerd to bust out my version 1 or version 2 figures. Those have to stay in pristine mint condition. With the new movie being announced, everybody should keep their eyes open for anything Snake Eyes. There's a lot of books out there that you should pick up, this being one of them. If you ever see this book in the wild, this is the G.I. Joe Special Number 1 Todd McFarlane homage cover. Absolutely gorgeous, one of my favorite all-time books. I pick it up every time I see it in the wild. It's very hard to find. Short printed book. I want to say this was the very last book that they printed, even after their final issue. So that's why it's so tough to find. Absolutely gorgeous cover. Very hard to find in high grade. Also be on the lookout for the Frankie's comic exclusive G.I. Joe number one by Clayton Crane. I'm absolutely in love with this cover. Clayton Crane, can't say enough. 
but he decided to put a Rattler on it. It's my favorite all-time G.I. Joe vehicle, one of the very first G.I. Joe vehicles I ever got, so I will be picking up that book. Big shout-out to Jack and Brian for letting me do the show this week. Thank you very much. Be sure to check out CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside every Monday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and our new show, Flipside Presents CBSI Hot 10, little switcheroo there, every Friday night. So as any self-respecting G.I. Joe fan would say, now you know, knowing's half the battle. Yuck. So there you have Brian McClay from the CBSI Presents Tales from the Flipside YouTube channel. I'm not going to take up too much time on this because I know this really hits home with Jack, huge G.I. Joe fanboy. But we love Snake Eyes. We've talked about Snake Eyes a lot on this channel lately, especially with the current G.I. Joe run that's going on. That whole snake hunt story arc, really, we both really enjoy that. We've talked about it on the Bolo Show. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, of course I love it. Um, and I think it may be a little early to, to fully, like be as hot as I think it's going to be, it's starting to heat up, though. And, you know, every time I talk about G.I. Joe, I, I get a little bit of shit because people say, well, you're a big G.I. Joe fan. Like, that discredits my speculation opinion on this one. But before, let me let me just say this. A lot of people, especially growing up in the 80s, when you think G.I. Joe, you either think, usually one or two, well, minus Cobra Commander, it's either Cobra Commander, Snake Eyes, or Storm Shadow. Absolutely. I mean, those are the three characters you think of most prominently, unless you just have some weird fetish with, like, <laughs> Baroness or <laughs> some other thing. But those are the main characters that people think of when they think G.I. Joe. Yeah, the reality is Baroness didn't really become popular until some of the more modern variant covers, like the Adam Hughes cover. That really brought Baroness into prominence. And the that reality, cover? Yeah. The reality is, um, it was, growing up, it was Snake Eyes was... The King, and it was the battle between Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow um, that really dominated. And, you know, we've seen since the Snake Eyes movie's been announced, and Brian's pick referenced Snake Eyes, but also that the, the heat has spilled over into Storm Shadow. We're seeing that G.I. Joe 21 silent issue spike back up again. Um, Snake Eyes it first appears in G.I. Joe Volume 1, Number 1. Now, that's always been an in-demand key issue. It's the first appearance of the G.I. Joe. Don't let anyone tell you that those older, like, DC Comics appearances, um, G.I. Joe was a generalized term. The Kenner toys that we, you will see in these Hasbro movies, they are the first appearing in that Marvel series from 1982 that G.I. Joe won. That's what you want. And um, with number one always being popular and kind of always being a, a high price, the book that everyone would always – overlook is gi joe 26 and 27 and that's the origin story of of uh of snake eyes and storm shadow and those are starting to really pop the last couple sales have hit like 25 to 35 dollars on on those individual issues in the sets um a little bit more and they were regularly trading just a couple weeks ago for like five dollars each so i expect to see that happen more and more I've covered first appearances of G.I. Joe's. The average speculator can't even tell you like what the first appearance of Destro is or what the first appearance of major G.I. Joe's like Flint or um, or uh, Duke. And these are characters who are just absolutely integral to the G.I. Joe story. And because of that, a lot of these books have sit under the radar. Now, we're talking Snake Eyes and we talk, like we said, Number one, number twenty six, and number twenty seven. Um, that GI Joe special that that Todd McFarlane that uh, uh, Brian showed there, incredible. Also, um, there's a few other key covers. Sixty three, the so much fun issue. Um, those are incredibly popular. There's a lot of great covers up in the hundreds that are really lower printed. But the biggest thing that I would keep an eye out for is those IDW incentives. There are a lot of times they're really tough to even find pricing information on because so few of them hit the market, specifically like the Snake Eyes solo story. Um, you're tempted to look at issue number one, but issue number one a lot of times in a lot of these IDW series are higher ordered. Um, but there is just several, several Snake Eyes cover uh, variants that are incredibly difficult to find. G.I. Joe number seven, which features like the, the American flag background, has sold extremely well. There's a um, Real American Hero, one of the older series, is Virgin cover with Snake Eyes where he's spiking the uh, sword into the ground, into the Cobra logo. That one has done well in the past. Um, 
there's I just so many numerous ones. Uh, G.I. Joe 18 is another one. But you know what the truth is? If you at all believe in the ability of these to do well in the secondary market, you got to do your research because it's it's difficult to start look, getting into these and looking them up because so few have hit the market. And that's the point that I've tried to make with G.I. Joe speculation. It's, yeah, I'm a big fan, but there's a lot of people like me. And what do people like me do? We buy these books and we keep them in our collection. The same way Brian has a nice Masters of the Universe collection. And it would be one of the toughest things for him to let go of everything he owns other than maybe some of his Disney books. I'm the same way with my G.I. Joe stuff. Not to say that I wouldn't sell it, but you got to give me the right price for it. And that ends up setting the market. So that's why you end up seeing prices that the average consumer feels like is ridiculous. And, and kind of evidence of that is the um, Purple Rain Prince homage, which you see with uh, snake eyes on the motorcycle. That book has sold for what, Brian? Like $500 in the past? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of a perfect storm of snake eyes cover, low print, plus an homage that resonates with people outside of the traditional buying community. Um, so there's, there's tons of books like that. And, um, snake eyes is the most, like Brian said, the most prominent GI Joe character. He's featured on many, many of the covers. Um, but those covers are always the most popular. And I think that the window to start buying some of these books is going to dwindle faster than I think buyers are really ready for, because just the talk that this is happening, we're already seeing casting. We already have a director attached. Um, I think this is moving along faster than people are really ready for. And it's only one of two G.I. Joe movies we're getting. We're getting a Snake Eyes solo movie, and then we're getting a G.I. Joe team movie. And both of these are already in pre-production or production. And you know that they're going to end up crossing over and weaving into each other. So uh, the time is now if you're going to jump on G.I. Joe. And what does the publishing side, like Brian mentioned, have going on right now? IDW's got a 10-issue story arc surrounding snake eyes and the original snake eyes the one that we're going to see in this movie is already dead in the comics and we've got two more snake eyes a throw down kamakura aka sean collins is snake eyes who first appears as snake eyes in issue 215 and we've got dawn moreno the first female snake eyes who first appeared in the comics and i believe issue 226 and then became uh snake eyes in 243 um kind of like fully assumed the mantle at like 244 and it was featured heavily on covers for 245 and 246 where the, the variants do extremely well and that story arc went all the way through 250 and now we're seeing with snake hunt them come back into prominence look for that cover a which already sold out it's sold out of midtown amazing cover with uh cobra rolling the snake eyes dice with the two snake eyes faces um i i'm really bullish on this story it may have moved kind of slow with the first issue but i think it's only going to get better and he mentioned the frankie's comics variant idw is doing a new gi joe series not part of real american hero a separate series just called gi joe which they've done from time to time and it is so cool to see a, a cover artist like clayton crane doing a G.I. Joe book to see like, you know, it's been a while since we've had like the R germs or the, the um, Adam Hughes, those top end uh, variant cover artists working on a G.I. Joe book. So I'm excited to see that shout out to Frankie's comics for making that happen. But another cool thing about that book is there's supposed to be a lot of first appearances in that book. They're, they're coming out with some new Joes for that series. So that's something I'd keep an eye out for. Cause there's no telling some of those new Joes could be the ones that end up in the movies. All right. So again, I want to thank Brian for that pick. And if you're watching, make sure you guys do check out CBS I Presents Tales from the Flipside. They are live every Monday night at 9.30. And they are now the home of the Hot 10 Show, which hosts the writer, the author of the list himself, Ben Stein. And with that being said, we're going to roll into the last of the hot picks this week. And this is a very special person, so I'm going to let Jack introduce this. This is... My favorite pinch hitter we have ever had, my daughter, Brianna Bolo, with her hot pick. <laughs> Brianna Bolo. We got BB. <laughs> Little BB. My name is Brianna Bolo, and my hot pick is female superheroes. There are a lot of girls like me reading the books and watching the movies. It's cool to see female superheroes kicking butt in the TV shows, movies, and comics. 
For example, Miss Marvel, Girl Thor, Jenica the Turtle, and Captain Marvel, and Harley Quinn. First thing I want to say is you need to save that so that she can watch it when she's older and she's getting into, you know. And people are like, oh, no, you just started getting into comics. You can be like, oh, no, been there, done that, and use this for schoolwork because there's going to be a project where you can use this at some point. But on top of that, fantastic pick, and I love seeing what you've talked about on the show before where your daughter, you can relate to these topics. We've talked about it during, like, Jane Foster Thor. We've talked about it with Gwen Stacy and Spider-Gwen. we talked about how it relates to that younger market and brings new readers into the hobby, which I think is the number one benefit of those characters prior to we even get into speculation. Anytime we can bring more people into the hobby is fantastic. I think this is a great pick. But, Jack, I... I'm going to let you talk about it. Well, yeah, I almost get choked up watching that. The poor girl was so nervous filming that segment. She was so excited when I asked her, and I said, hey, you want to be on the Hot and Cold show this week? But, uh, yeah, she was so nervous filming that, and uh, great job, Brianna. I appreciate it. And you you may notice she's wearing a Flash T-shirt. My daughter is a certified comic fan. She loves some books that I know like your kids have gotten into, like Captain Underpants and Dogman and some <laughs> of those some of those kinds of um, comic properties. Um, but she's also – she loves any kind of superheroes, and they don't have to be female. But she really gets a sense of pride from watching some of these female superheroes. She, When she was younger, she was so excited to be Thor for Halloween. I've talked about that. She's big into Jenica Turtle right now. She's very because she grew up a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan since birth. So getting to see uh, a female Ninja Turtle gets her excited, and I think that that gets lost on a lot of the the male speculators, guys of our age, where we get all upset when you know Marvel, DC, IDW, anybody really, when they do these things to try to be more inclusive to the female reader. If you're at comic book conventions, you will notice that female comic book buyers, female comic book readers are increasing. It's just reality. There's more and more of them. And, you know, while they love the male superheroes, it is important that everybody sees themselves in the superheroes. And that's why I love Spider-Gwen, you know, because, you know, Spider-Man has often has that line into the Spider-Verse that anybody can wear the mask. And I love that my daughter is getting to grow up in an era where once the Disney Plus you know, channel that we have been talking about now for several weeks hits. She's going to be able to see She-Hulk, Miss Marvel. Um, she's going to be able to watch Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur on Disney+. Plus. She's getting to see Jenica Turtle play out in the pages of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, she got to see a version of Thor in the comics, and now she's going to get to see that make the transition into a movie. Um, so... I get to watch those things through her eyes, and it has really changed my perspective. And I'm not judging anybody who has been kind of against those things, but if if I didn't have two daughters who love that stuff, I may have been in that same boat. And watching their excitement over those properties has always made me realize that there is that community out there that is going to love those things. And that makes them good speculation plays, because that's why we're here, right? And the reality is... I'm more apt to buy those books because of my daughter. So it's not, you may say, well, yeah, Brianna's not out there buying those $40 and $50 Jane Foster Thor number ones, no doubt. But I'm buying it to put in her short box for her collection so as she gets older, she's got those copies. And that is where the value is, is the fact that there's a lot of dads out there raising daughters. Um, There's a lot of people out there who can resonate with these stories. And like even she mentioned Harley Quinn, we saw the Birds of Prey trailer leaked out within the last week. Now, I don't think that's a movie I'm going to let my daughter see. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. But she is a big Harley Quinn fan. And, you know, it just seems like we're going to see more and more female superheroes showing up, I think, over the next few years. So you don't have to like it, but I think we all kind of got to get used to it. Right. And that's going to wrap up the hot list for the week, which I can think of no better way to do so than with... BB. <laughs> the youngest Bolo. ever. The youngest ever yes. entry on the Hot and Cold show. But we're going to roll right into the cold list. Going back to Covertoons author Mike Morello. 
Hey everybody, Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes here again with my cold pick this week. And this week's cold pick is really more of a tepid pick. It's more of a buying opportunity, um, and really it's because of the surrounding sort of chatter about Marvel monsters. We're not really sure of all the details. Um, we don't really have any characters to focus on just yet, um, which leaves sort of a wide open door. We've heard uh, some rumblings about a few things. People are speculating on man things, so obviously Savage Tales number one is important. Um, people are speculating about maybe a tie in between that whole Son of Satan, possibly Mephisto, those sorts of things. So those, those books are obviously key. But there's a lot of under the radar stuff that people might not be paying attention to right now. There's the obvious choice like this one, which is still a relatively inexpensive book, Legion of Monsters, uh, Marvel premiere number 28. Um, but there are some other really um, under-the-radar ones. Um, obviously, Tomb of Dracula is an interesting one. Tomb of Dracula number one, everyone's focused on number 10 right now because of Blade. You might be able to find yourself a nice number one, which is a really cool way to get that. Um, there's also some other really cheap ones right now, Giant Size Chillers, which is first Lilith. A lot of people think this character is going to pop up in something. Um, there's the Giant Size Creatures, number one, which not only has a werewolf by night appearance, but of course the first Tigra, which ties into yet another possible show for Marvel. Um, and that's still really, really cheap, really cheap buy right now. But that's really not what I'm focused on. What I'm focused on mostly is some of that really sort of hard to find Silver Age monster stuff that came before the superhero books. Like uh, the pre Spider Man amazing adult fantasy issues, like number 13 and number 14, which all have monster appearances in them, and in a lot of cases, prototypes of our up and coming superheroes. Um, you got other titles like Tales of Suspense, like this one. This is the first prototype of Doctor Doom, but a really cool monster book. And then there's this one too, which is uh, first Colossus, but obviously he looks like Thing, so you've got that one too. And then there's some others as well. You've got Strange Tales and other Tales of Suspense. There's a lot of those issues that can really be found fairly inexpensively, um, $100 or less. And um, right now I think is one to get them, because if any of these characters pop, these books are going to become nuclear because they're really rare. Um, so keep your eyes out for these Silver Age books. Obviously the Bronze Age ones too. There's some really cheap ones to be had there. But those Silver Age ones, if you can find those, those are cold at the moment. And they will be insane if any of those characters get announced. So that's my cold pick for the week, but it is also a buying opportunity. So head out and try to find those. Thanks everybody. Have a great week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Talking about monster books, but I was totally distracted because I love Mike's picks, and oops, he did it again, because he's got a damn Britney Spears t-shirt on. During the hot picks, we were talking about it going, is that a Britney Spears shirt? But that is definitely a Britney Spears shirt. And, I digress, Marvel Monster Books, cold, good buying opportunity. He brought out a lot of old, classic ones that are definitely worth picking up, especially if you can find them cheap. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? I love it. I think, um when there was a lot of speculation about Marvel monsters, they got hot. Um, Especially with Groot with Guardians. Yeah, Groot with Guardians, and a lot of people wanted to see where that was going to go, and that looked like it was a... It looks like that was a completely separate thing. And then recently, there was a lot of talk about Marvel monsters appearing in the MCU. And Kid um, Kaiju and all that stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. And, um, you know, and again, full transparency, the Key Collector app, they did a, um, a feature on Marvel monsters, and there was a lot of speculation talk about Marvel monsters and those things tend to have windows. So you saw a lot of talk about that for a while and now that talk has kind of died down. So I think there's still some credence to the fact that Marvel monsters will probably show up somewhere, especially with us moving into horror. You mentioned kid Kaiju. I like that one a lot because I really think Amadeus Chow is a character we're going to see at some point. And I think kid Kaiju would kind of be perfect. Um, but I think that, the question becomes, and this is where we're in that pure speculative mode, what Marvel monsters do we pay attention to? I like those There's, Monsters Unleashed books they had, was it, a couple years ago? 2014, yeah, 15? The little... And I, I think a lot of people go to that old stuff and pay attention to that. And I, I shouldn't say old stuff, but you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> that silver and bronze age kind of um, key issues. And uh, I know I tend to be a modern guy. But when they're basing these movies, it seems like they pull so much from more modern comics. And I think you made a great point. Like, they, they had to come out with those Monsters Unleashed books for a reason. There had to be some reason they were, they were bringing those back. Now, some of it was just Jack Kirby nostalgia. But I really think that a lot of the stuff that went on there is stuff to pay attention to. And either way, there's a lot of, like, undervalued high-ratio variants in those, 
in those runs that are a little more accessible than like Amazing Fantasy 13 and 14, which are still tough to find books. But um, Mike's got an amazing collection, so he's always dropping, uh, you know, heater books on us every single week. But, you know, I, I love the Legion of Monsters stuff. I love the Dracula spec play. I think that's going to play right into Blade really well. Um, and I think that th those books have been long overlooked. Either way, you know, the beauty of uh, the cold pick is we're getting ahead of the market. That's the point. And we know that the market is going to go horror. We know that we're going to go with a lot of these darker properties. Um, and I think now is the time to get in on it, whether it's Werewolf by Night, whether it's Dracula, whether it's the actual, like, monsters, um, and or whether we're looking at Monster Unleashed modern-type variant spec or Kid Kaiju. I think now is the time to buy that stuff because it's all down. And uh, even though it may have been up just a few weeks or a couple months ago, we're already seeing those downtrends, and that's the spec cycle. So you want to buy on the down, not on the up. And uh, now is kind of that time to be able to scoop up some stuff that you may not have been able to scoop up just a couple months ago. And with that being said, we're going to roll right into the next cold pick coming from Mark Defiant, a.k.a. Mark DeMeo, a.k.a. Mark Bolo, a.k.a. Cold Pick. My name is Mark Defiant, and I've done camera work for both CBSI and Simple Men's Comics. My cool pick is cameos. It seems like the market can't really decide on what a first appearance is and what a cameo is. There doesn't seem to really be a set of rules for what a first appearance is. This means that there are buying opportunities because cameos can go cheap. My brother, Mr. Bolo, has even talked about this multiple times on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. Donnie Cates has even said that Venom number seven is the first appearance of Dylan. That seems like a good opportunity. So my cool pick is cameos. So there we go, Mark Defiant, fantastic cool pick. We're talking about cameos, and we've had the we've we've discussed this on this channel before, especially with the first appearance is a first appearance. We think once the per once the character first appears. That's the first appearance, and he brought up the point that Donny Cates just on Twitter this past couple days said, I don't understand the confusion. That is Dylan, right, in issue number seven. Yeah, and just like most younger brothers, man, he knows how to push my buttons because nothing gets me more fired up than talking about this topic. I don't understand how the market got so out of whack, and I, I blame Hulk 181. I honestly do because that's the reference point that everybody wants to bring up. But even Marvel, with their House of X uh, and Powers of X preview, they acknowledged Hulk 180 as the first appearance. Furthermore, I found some old Marvel trading cards that featured first appearances on the back, and they had, in the early 90s, Hulk 180 listed as the first appearance. So it's just us dumb comic book collectors and speculators who have been running off with the wrong information. You got that, now, you got that Wolverine rookie card? <laughs> Yeah, you know that yeah, that Wolverine rookie card, exactly. You know, looking for that PSA ten, baby. But that's a th that's the thing. Like, who is this really benefiting? All of this misinformation, and honestly, it's those comic book politicians. And you know, you guys have heard me talk about this before. It's it's all about people trying to sway the market. So, look, if we're talking Dylan Brock, something so a character that I've heavily specced on, I've talked about, I own a good stack of both seven and nine. And I know to protect myself because I know this game and I know that people are going to play that game. So I bought both. But the reality is I'll never understand why someone makes a decision. Well, seven, there's not enough. Uh, I, what is the rule? In, in my opinion, if a character shows up, it's a first appearance. But we've got all these fake rules about, well, you got to be able to speak. Well, this character only shows up at one panel. Well, apparently the last page doesn't count now ever, because if it shows up in the last page, people automatically discredit it. Um, and comic book companies are aware of this. So they play these games where they have a character show up unsolicited on the last page and they know that you're going to grab it, but then you're also going to say, well, no, that's not the first appearance. We got to get the next issue star with captain Marvel being the most recent one that comes to mind. But the reality of the situation is the term, First appearance should mean exactly like Brian said, what it says. The first appearance. The first time I appeared on this channel was my first appearance. Now, you can say it wasn't the Bolo show, and I'm a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. True, it wasn't. It was just a one-shot live stream. But it was still my first appearance. It was the first time I appeared on the show. And, Brian, here's another thing I want to bring up. 
where, why are we misusing the term cameo? Shout out to my man Scott from the Simpleman's Comics Patreon who brought this up. If you look up the definition of cameo, cameo is when one known entity shows up in another property, essentially. So to give an example of what a cameo is. They would have already had to first appear. <laughs> they would have already exactly had to first appear because it would be a known entity. So a real cameo is when we talked about on the pre-FOC show, The Last Call, right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel, which comes out every Friday now at 9 p.m., we talked about Amazing Spider-Man 30 last week, and we said, well, the spec on that is it's a it's a tie-in to Absolute Carnage. Carnage is showing up in that book. Dylan Brock is showing up in that book. Well, if you want to know what Dylan Brock's real cameo appearance is, he cameo appears in Absolute Carnage and in Amazing Spider-Man 30 because those are not his titles. Those are not the series he comes from. He comes from Venom, and he's showing up in those. Carnage shows up in... Amazing Spider-Man. He's cameoing in Amazing Spider-Man. That's the definition of cameo. We have completely changed the definition to fit our narrative in the speculation community. And I lump myself into the speculation community. I'm part of it. We're all part of it. Brian, you're part of it. But it's one of those things where we as, whether you want to call us influencers or YouTubers or content creators... We all get to have our opinion. This is our platform. So this is me and Brian's opinion. And we're at a point where we're saying no mas. You know, there's just, we can't do this anymore. It's confusing to new collectors who come in and we're kind of educating them the wrong way. And then every, it seems like every character has multiple first appearances. Every character has a, for a first appearance and a full first. And it takes Savage She-Hulk where a character's in the guts, on the title, and on the cover before no one argues it. And it shouldn't be that much. That's not what it should be. So if you ask me, if you ask AKA Mr. Bolo, I there's so many books where I, and I say shout out to Mark for pointing this out, where I feel like the cameos are undervalued. What if one day there is a course correction, Brian? What if one day the market shifts and says, well, we're not going to go with this anymore. Avengers 195 would be the first appearance of Taskmaster. Uncanny X-Men uh, Annual 14 would be the first appearance of gambit um i'm sorry but amazing spider-man 299 is the first appearance of venom um you know all of these things would suddenly change and i don't think that we're going to be able to see that type of a course correction but i think we should and either way i think that those appearances are all undervalued um because a character truly first appears in those issues and it's certainly not a cameo because no one knew who those characters are. Therefore, by definition, it cannot be a cameo. That is just a term we made up to fit this narrative. And now when I say we, I don't mean me. I didn't make that term up. It long existed before I was in comics. I don't mean my partner in spec over there, Brian, a.k.a. Simpleman's Comics. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean the market, the community. We have all made up this term to fit this narrative, and it's, and it's silly. So you take someone like Donny Cates. Who is a reader? Who's, who openly says he's not a collector? Danny Cates Bryan is the type of guy who's got the comic rolled up in his back pocket of his Levi's jeans. That's the kind of guy Donny Cates is. Doesn't mean he doesn't love comics. He's just, he fits that segment. And when openly asked on Twitter, hey, seven or nine, what's the first appearance? He wasn't being sarcastic. He wasn't being an asshole. He was just honestly answering that question. And to him, it was a silly question. So of course it's issue seven. That's the first time he appeared, right? And then people started asking him, well, do you think Venom's first appearance is two ninety nine? He was like, well, I don't want to get into that. Because he knew better. He knew that that's when we're getting into comics politics. That's where people are trying to sell their narrative. But for the guy who wrote it, that's how he felt. Another example was I interviewed Lee Weeks for ComicBookInvest.com a few years ago at HeroesCon. Lee Weeks was the artist behind um, Convergence Superman. And then he also did Superman, Lois, and Clark that popular series where Jonathan Kent first appears. And I asked him, what's the first appearance of, of uh, Jonathan Kent? And he kind of laughed and was like, well, I mean, we showed his birth in the comic. So he was kind of like, well, of course, that would be the first appearance, right? But speculators create this rule that like baby appearances don't count. So, you know, every time you ask a comic creator that, you're always going to get a literal answer. And I just don't understand why those literal answers aren't what we're going for. When that makes it so simple, that kills all confusion. 
if the first time a character appears, it's a first appearance, this this becomes the easiest thing in the world to speculate on. But instead, because we want to try to fit narratives that aid us uh, financially, we have to complicate the heck out of this. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Well, it's not complicated. It's just tied to it because you have so much dollars tied to it now. So right. they don't want to reverse it because now you're going to reverse the market, which is a lot of people are going to lose out on money. So they keep up with, with the trend. But, but there's but there's even contradictory appearances. There's ones I, – I could pick ones that contradict where this character is not considered a first appearance because they say he doesn't do enough. And then this character is. So there's there's no set set of rules. Right. But that's for another show. Yeah, I could do I could honest to God do a whole show on that. So we're just gonna go from there and we're gonna roll right into the next cold pick, which comes from Usual Suspects author on comicbookinvest.com, Peter Renna. What's up, everybody? This is Peter Renna back with my cold pick for this week. And my cold pick is a little bit of a buying opportunity for you, and that's Spider-Man 2099. Uh, back in December, that all of his books and that character really jumped with his little cameo after credit scene into the Spider-Verse. And uh, expectation is he's going to be in the sequel, which Sony's bound to make. So these books are going to go up, but right now they're uh, pretty darn cold. Uh, again, back in December, there was 325 sales of this Amazing Spider-Man 365, which is the first appearance, so that hologram cover, of uh, Spider-Man 2099, and that was a $250.90 in December, and now it's selling for about $130. Bucks. So uh, there could be some room to bounce back up into the $200 plus range. And again, 325 sales back in December, only 41 uh, this month so far. And Spider-Man 2099, number one, which I have somewhere, but I couldn't file, find it in the filing cabinet, so uh, you're just going to have to remember what it looks like. Uh, that's still just a $65.98 right now, but copies were flying. Again, 136 sales back in December, now about 40 Again, prices are down. You can get either of them raw, around 10 bucks, maybe 15 at the most with shipping, uh, so they're cheap buy-ins, and uh, with those thicker cardstock covers, there's usually not a lot of damage, or the damage is very evident, so uh, you can get a clean copy pretty easily. So uh, those are books you might want to think about uh, maybe a year or two out. Who knows how long it takes that animation to go but uh spider-man 2099 is uh cold spider-man 2099 i think even when this was hot at the time i think it was cold because i think it was being hot for all the wrong reasons little x credit scene shows up at the end of spider edge of spider-verse love that movie i love that character i want to see the spec get hyped up on that character for the stories that he's been in some of the comics that are out there that exist not just because they saw a little extra credit scene at the end of a movie but there's no denying that yes those books did take off from that scene everyone sees something everyone instantly thinks option news and everyone drives speculation crazy with that option news and then it's kind of died down from that cycle so there are buying opportunities for this but i've said it i think we said it last week on i forget what show we were talking about but still that freaking peter david 2099 series with those matina covers absolutely gorgeous we saw that speculation kind of tail over into some of those covers at some point and then that's when it kind of died off but what do you think about this cold pick jack i love this cold pick um to be honest with you because it's kind of been formulaic, though, Brian, where in most Marvel movies, a character shows up in the post credit scene, that's a tip of the hat that that character is coming. Now, having said that, I agree with you. I love Spider-Man 2099 for a lot of reasons. Um, I've always enjoyed it as a kid. It's from like th that era when I was first getting into comics and reading comics. Um, so it's always been a character that resonates with me. Before Miles Morales existed, that was my other spider-man um and i had the toys as a kid um you know so that was always a a popular character for me another thing is that character is always because that character's always been popular with me and people of a certain age i talk a lot about the value of doing live sales whether it's conventions flea markets things like that Sp spider-man 2099 number one and asm 365 have always sold well always now you're not gonna get rich off of them the prices that, uh, not counting the graded prices, but the prices that Peter quoted, that's pretty typical, 10 to $15. But Brian, I know you know, you're a comic book veteran. Those have been easily found in dollar bins over the years, quite frequently. I pick those up anytime I find them cheap. And there's just always going to be a market for a newer comic book collector who's maybe just re-getting back into it 
who collected as a child who will see that Spider-Man 2099 in your short box and get excited um, and will grab that book. And I, I literally sold a couple copies this weekend. I sell a, co- a couple copies at every show. That's why it's constantly a book I, I want to kind of pick up again. And that Peter David run, that number one from that series does well. Um, a lot of those uh, Matina covers that you talk about do well. Uh, they, I like to group up a lot of those, sell them as kind of like a run or a little small set. Um, but, you know, I know that Peter was talking heavy on the, the graded side. And certainly a lot of those cardstock covers, they can be, you know, they're stiff and you can get them in good shape. The, you can get real high grades, but a lot of them are easy to bend. So they, that that can be tough. But, you know, just talking raw copies, that's, it's an easy, easy sale. Um, so eBay's a little different. You've got a bigger marketplace. It's a little tougher. Um, there's a lot of books on there that people want. And that may not be the most in-demand book. But I agree with him that I think that Spider-Man 2099 is going to show up in the next Spider-Verse movie. And you do want to get ahead of the market, but I would say all Spider Verse spec you could put on the cold list because I'd could say the same about like Spider Ham, who we saw directly in in the first movie. Um, I don't think uh, you know uh, Spider Man Nor is selling well uh, at this point either, um, but or Penny Parker. But anyways, I I think that Spider Man twenty ninety nine is a good one. And another thing to to bring up, Brian, I don't even remember if he mentioned it. Um, 2099 is coming back as a se- event series later in the year. Yep. So there could be some rejuvenated interest in 2099 characters in general. Here's some real speculative thing to look out for is if they do go heavy with Spider-Man 2099 in the next Into the Spider-Verse movie, could we see the 2099 version of Venom as a main villain? And would those issues heat up? That's another thing to keep an eye out for because those have often been popular with speculators. So great pick from Peter, and we're going to get into the last pick, the last cold pick, the last pick for this week's list, and it comes from the mass speculator, Topher S. What's up, speculators? This is Topher S., the writer of CBSI's True First, with your cold pick of the week. Canto, canto, canto. This book slide highlights a sad fact about the wild, wild west that is modern flipping. Look, I like the book. The art's okay, and the story's pretty good. But like so many before it, I'm talking about you, Todd, the ugliest kid on earth. An initial FOMO cannot be sustained, especially in this market. If you didn't buy it cheap, your money was better spent elsewhere. For minis like this, I see nowhere to go but down, and the dark, dank basement awaits once that final issue drops. Without an option, Kanto will not survive. I know I'll be buying it, though, in 12 months. See you next week! Say goodbye, Stella. Go for us. Talking about Canto, one that you and I are favorites of. We love this book. We we love the book from a reader point of view. We love the book from a speculation point of view. He does make up some points that is kind of cooled off. I think the buzz for it's kind of cooled off. But as you were talking before, and I'll let you support that point, is we did see that there are some still active sales going on. What do you think about this, Jack? Well, I feel some sort of way about this pick, Brian. I do agree. Um, I think where Topher's coming from is issue number three. Issue number three doesn't sell what issue number one and two did. But I think that's because LCS's online dealers, they picked up on what Canto number one and two. We talked about like FOC. We're we're talking FOC a lot on this channel now. And we're trying to educate people on how that works. And the orders for number two had to be in before number one hit stores which is why you saw the same print run damage on number two as number one. Number three, you were able to react to the sales of issue number one and number two and up your order. So because of that, issue number three isn't moving as high. I will also say I don't love the issue number three, Jerome Opeña, one and ten, as much as I love the incentives for issue number one and number two. And that's no knock on Jerome Opeña. I just think that the cover art for Canto has been fantastic. But yes, if you look at the last four sold Canto listings in general on eBay, you have a issue number three. Um, excuse me, I said Jerome Pena. That's Jorge Corona. Um, but you have a issue number three, one in ten, and cover A combo that sold for thirty-five shipped. Then you have two Frankie's Comics Virgin covers, which were sold for sixteen dollars on Frankie'sComics.com. One sold for forty-five thirty. 
and one sold for $37.99 ship, respectively. Very nice ROIs on those. And then you saw a VF near mint, because remember, a lot of printer damage on those books. Copy of Canto Number 1 Cover A sell for $24.99 shipped. So there's still demand on issue number one, for sure. That's still a solid book. Um, issue number two may have dropped down a bit, and issue number three may be performing a little less. The late printings, while having gorgeous cover art, weren't really big spec plays, because again, LCSs were all over. It's all about supply and demand. Um, but I think that Canto as a spec play is still a solid spec play. I think Canto number one is still holding strong at its current market value. Um, and full disclosure, my man Topher has been against Canto since day one. He was talking Canto cold pick, busting our chops when Brian and I were big on Canto, maybe two days after the release of that book. So while I am certainly uh, biased and a big fan of Canto, I've talked about it a lot, I don't think Topher is a big fan of Canto. So it's all about different perspectives. And that's the beauty of IDW books is they're not printed in such high enough numbers that everybody needs to be on board with them. So you can have guys like Topher who just – it's really not their thing. It's not what they, they, they're they into. Um, and guys like Brian and I who really enjoy the story and love the art um, can speculate on it and play in a smaller pond. I'd rather do that than some of these big Marvel releases. But I, I – I think it'll be interesting to see where the trend goes because you could see a rebound if if stores then say, ah, oh, you know, I didn't sell all those issues twos and threes that I wanted to um, so or those late printings. So maybe I'll order less of four or five, which issue five we're going to talk about on Friday. Um, if some of those orders start to fall off, you could see a rebound in price. But um, Canto is still a book I believe in for a speculation play. Hashtag seven seasons in a movie. Um, that for sure is still something that we believe in. And he said, you know, it's only chance long-term is adaptation. And that's something that I think uh, has a good shot at happening. But even if it doesn't, it's, it's an amazing story. Yeah, and I think a lot of my enjoyment from the book, not only is it a great story and great art, but I think I'm also closer to the book because we've had that connection where we've talked to the creators and know what level of effort and the, the heart that they've put into that book kind of right. naturally draws us closer to the book so i don't know you you had a good argument of recent sales that proved that it might be not as cold as we think but i'm fully recognize the point that i'm closer to the book so i might yeah. not see the forest from the trees and other people might see it as cold either way i love the story shout out to david Brewer and drew zucker fantastic work on that book and then thanks for Topher for that pick and with that being said that's gonna bring us our hot and cold list for this week. So we're going to bring the list up right now. And, Jack, real quick, we got Hot, we got She-Hulk, we got Moon Girl, Black Spectre, we got Donny Cates, Snake Eyes, we have X-Men books, and then we have female action figures. And then for cold, we had... Female our, superheroes. Female superheroes, sorry, I said action figures. My bad. For cold, we had Marvel Monsters, Cameos, Spider-Man 2099, and Canto. I think it's a pretty good list this week. What do you think, Jack? I think I do. I think it's a really good list. Like I said, I may be biased being that I'm uh, a family member of a certain portion of this list. Um, and I definitely want to say shout out to my brother and uh, to my daughter, Brianna. I love you. But, um, you know, at the same point, I think... This list is very accurate. We're talking about some D23 properties that have really taken off. We're talking about some wide scoping trends like female superheroes. That's a, that's a pretty wide topic as well as cameos. Um, certainly a wide topic. Shout out to Topher for keeping us honest with the Canto um, cold pick. Uh, I, re I really like this list. I think this list stands up really well. And that's what we want from the Hot and Cold Show on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel is we want a list that incorporates all of the market and talks about those controversial topics. Right. I will say one book. We see a trend on this. And I hope that trend turns around because I love those books so much. But we're still not seeing DC on the hot list that much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, that's true. We're not seeing much DC. And the only time it seems like DC shows up is when we're talking about it as a cold pick. Whether it was Dan Piercy from the Reading Piles. Um, 
uh, pick of uh, DC Black Label, whether we're talking about, I think Mike Morello picked Middleton variants um, a few weeks back. But with Just the same s- thing also is we've seen that trend flip-flop over the past couple years also. It wasn't but a few years ago where DC seemed to have all the great stories and Marvel was kind of in, in the trenches and people were like, right. oh, DC's so great. So, I mean, it's only a matter of time. That's what's so great about books and stories and comics. One's on top one time and then next thing you know, it's flip-flopped and it, that's why we do this video. Right, and here's one for you right now that seems to be heating up right now. It's that Bat, Batwing uh, 19, first appearance of uh, Lucas Fox with the Bleeding Cool article that Batman wants to, or that DC wants to do a African-American Batman at some point. There's a lot of speculation that that will be the character. We don't even know if that's the character. It could be a completely different character, but that seems to be the one that people are going with. So you never know. Maybe next week that's what we're talking about. Too early to tell. Right. So I do want to say thank you once again to the DeMeo family singers slash pickers for their picks this week. Thanks for helping us on the body bag episode. Thank you for Rooster River also for providing the hot pick. And uh, we are in negotiations with McClay about having him be a, a permanent fixture here. So we will keep you updated on that with his hot and cold picks going forward. But in the meantime, make sure you check him out on Tales from the Flip Side. Also, he's also on a bunch of other podcasts. One's called The Bogcast, I believe. B-O-G-C-A-S-T. So make sure you search and check that out. Tomorrow night, we have the Bolo Show. Right? We do. We, we do. That is that is our kind of one take. It used to be live. Now it's pre-recorded. But it's still uh, it's a one take show where we are just out there ripping on what's going on with the new comics of the, of the week. And um, it's kind of my favorite show of the week to get to just – Get out there and talk new comics. Right. And then, of course, Friday we round out the week with a brand new show we started just last week. And it's called Last Call, where we have that good old pub bar themed. So pull up a stool, grab yourself a drink. And we are going to be talking about pre-FOC books that are going to hit final order cutoff the following Monday. So this Friday we'll be talking about books that will hit final order cutoff the come the Monday after this weekend. So make sure you tune into that because it is controversial. People oh, think yeah. we are all of a sudden upping print runs so drastically and manipulating the market. And all we're doing is presenting books that you should be able to get before the a cutoff. Right, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. And I said, you know, I said that the, um, the Bolo show is my favorite show of the week, but I tell you what, I could see last call jumping that because I'm excited. I was excited to do it last week. I'm even more excited to come back. And like you said, pick, pull up a stool, sit down and talk about uh, um, Last Call, those, those last chance opportunities to get on, on books cheap. And uh, that's what the speculation game is all about, is trying to buy things at the cheapest price and trying to get ahead of the market. Yes. And that's what we're here to do is help the community. And uh, that's our main goal is serve our community with uh, transparency and integrity. And that show does it to a T. Right. So like we said, we like to talk about what's hot and cold in the market trends. We like to talk about what's hot during release. And then we like to wrap up the week with telling you what books we see as potentially being hot later on down the road when they do get released. And with that being said, that's going to wrap up the Hot and Cold Show. We look forward to seeing you right here tomorrow during the live chat of the premiere of the CBSI Bolo Show. (laughs) 